Upon the calendar page for May, in my book of parochial use, it says, In June the hay shall come on quick, the barley next to reap. Prepare the threshing floor, and for the latter level keep. Drive out the drones, let hives be purged of all the busy bees, let beans be plucked, let cheese be made midst budding apple trees. We start off this month by looking at St Botolph, whose feast day is on the 17th. Botolph is one of those saints who was very dear to our ancestors, but whose cult seems largely unknown outside of the Orthodox Church today. London especially seems to have had a particular devotion to him, and some of the famous parish churches in and around the city of London still bear his name, St Botolph's without Bishopsgate and St Botolph's without Oldgate being the best known. Botolph originally formed one half of a saintly double act with his brother Adolf. As young men, they left England for Gaul and Germany, where Adolf became the Bishop of Utrecht. Eventually, Botolph returned to England, and in the year 654, founded a monastery in Boston. That's the original Boston in Lincolnshire, from where, many centuries later, the Pilgrim Fathers would set off on their long journeys to the New World. In fact, Boston is a corruption of the Old English Bottleston, Bottles Town, Boston. So really, Bottle has in his own way played quite an important role in the development of both the UK and the United States. He was later proclaimed far and wide as being a remarkably learned and holy man and was acclaimed as a saint alongside his brother soon after his death. On the 22nd, we have the feast of the proto-martyr or first martyr of England, St Alban. St Alban is someone who almost everybody has heard of. Not many people actually know the details about his life, however, and especially some of the stranger legends surrounding his martyrdom. St Alban was a Roman soldier who converted to Christianity while he was posted in Viriolanum, around the 3rd or 4th centuries. He was arrested around that time for harbouring a priest in his quarters and pulled up in front of a magistrate on the spot who, as bad luck would have it, just happened to be standing next to a pagan altar in the middle of offering a sacrifice. He demanded that Alban participate in the rite, and Alban refused, saying, I worship and adore the true and living God who created all things. This deeply angered the judge, who ordered that Alban be scourged and beheaded. The sequence for the day tells us, Golden hymns are now resounding, telling of his gift of grace, cleansed of sin and never fearing, even before the monarch's face. Oh, what mystery see we in that fearless gaze. Alban was led off out of the town over a river for his date with the executioner. However, clearly this whole tableau was becoming something of a spectacle because the only bridge over the river was completely jam-packed full of people from the town who had turned out to watch. Alban looked up to heaven and prayed, and the waters of the river parted, allowing him safely to walk over. The sequence continues. He cruel punishment awaiting as a prisoner was led, dried the stream and thither passing, safely walking o'er its bed. Such sweet waters also sprang forth at his head. This last line alludes to the curious happenings surrounding his actual execution. The original executioner was sufficiently freaked by the parting of the waters to refuse to execute him. So another soldier took Alban 500 paces up a hill into a wildflower meadow. At the top of the hill, Alban said another prayer and at his feet, a spring of water flowed out of the ground. Then he knelt down and had his head chopped off at which point the eyes of the executioner popped out of his face, and Alban's head and the executioner's eyes merrily rolled down the hill together with the water from the new spring. When they reached the bottom, another spring of water flowed out of the ground to meet them. What a lovely thought. The sequence continues. Precious martyr, hear our anthems, to thy suppliants give peace. Bring us there where joy is endless, thine own triumph to increase. Alleluia, alleluia. England's song shall never cease. Turning to something completely different, in my last video you might have heard me referencing the coming of the dog days. The dog days are the days in summer which are associated with the heliacal rising of the star system Sirius, known as the dog star, which has traditionally been associated with heat, drought, sudden thunderstorms, lethargy, fever, 
mad dogs, bad luck, and all-round general discomfort. In ancient times, they believed that the rising of the dog star was itself the cause of disease, and let's hope that they were wrong. That being said, I can see how sultry hot days, stagnant water and a general malaise could contribute significantly to a general feeling of illness. In any case, it's best to stay cautious because, as the 1729 book The Husbandman's Practice says, The heat of the sun is so violent, the men's bodies at midnight sweat as if it was midday. And if they be hurt, they be more sick than at any other time, yea, very near dead. It therefore advised that men should abstain all this time from women, and to take heed of feeding violently. A couple of days later on the 23rd, we have the feast of St. Etheldreda. Etheldreda was an Anglo-Saxon royal princess. Around the age of 14 or 15, she was forced, or accidentally, married a not very nice king called Egfrith. It was agreed that they should live together, but that Etheldreda, who always wanted to be a nun, would be allowed to keep out of the marital bed. Things went okay for a few years between them, but after a while the whole relationship broke down and Etheldreda had to run away. Egfrith was enraged and pursued his wife across the countryside until he had her cornered on a small rock called Colbert's Head jutting out into the sea. Just as Egfrith arrived to kidnap her back into marriage, the tide swelled and prevented him crossing over to claim his wife. He decided to wait it out for a couple of hours until the tide went down, but after waiting for seven hours straight for the water to abate, he realised that someone even higher than the king was protecting her. So he gave up and returned back to his own land and left her up to her own devices, and thank goodness he did, because she went on to found Ely Cathedral. Etheldreda was a snappy dresser in her youth, and was apparently quite famous as something of an Anglo-Saxon fashion icon, with chunky jewelled necklaces being her signature accessory. However, she later deeply regretted the time and effort that she had put into her neckwear, and believed that the tonsillitis which eventually killed her was a divine punishment for it. After her death, a surgeon made an incision into her neck to check out the cause of death, and swore afterwards that the wound had posthumously healed, and this gave her cult a particular focus on throat problems. Toward the end of the month, we have the curious tradition of St John's Fire, which happens on the eve or night before, the Feast of the Nativity of St John the Baptist. The rubric for St John's Eve in my parochial use reads, Upon the eve of St John the Baptist's day, it is custom for the priest to bless a bonfire, commonly called St John's Fire, the which he may do after the following form. First he reads the 85th Psalm. Lord, thou art become gracious unto thy land. Thou hast turned away the captivity of Jacob. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall flourish out of the earth, and righteousness hath looked down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall show loving kindness, and our land shall give her increase. After the conclusion of the psalm, he blesses the fire, and afterwards says, Prevent us, we beseech thee, O Lord, always here and everywhere with celestial light, that we may both discern with clear vision, and worthily and effectually receive the mystery whereof thou hast willed us to be partakers. This is another of those extremely ancient traditions with deep origins in the pre-Christian past, which has been sanctified and transformed and brought into the fold of the church. It has something to do with the passing of the summer solstice. As St John the Baptist said, I must decrease so he may increase, so the days now start to decrease in the long run up to Christmas. The bonfire represents the burning and shining light of John the Baptist coming into the world to prepare the way for Christ. The rubric at the end of the blessing notes, by tradition on this day, is kept an all-night vigil at the fire. The sequence for the feast reads, The Lamb that doth our life bestow, with his pure fleece he doth us drape. He is the Lord whom thou didst show, and with thy finger indicate. May we, arrayed in white, follow him to that gate, by angels to be born, where light shall never wane. O friend of Christ, O blessed John. 
And so another month draws to a close. I apologise that this video was too late to actually come out in June, but I've been very, very busy over the last month and these videos took a bit of a back seat. Please do prod me in the chat if you feel that I'm slacking. I do read all the comments. I will be doing July very soon, hopefully to catch the end of the month. And until then, beloved listener, may St Botolf and St Adolf, the glorious flowers of Lincolnshire known across the seas, St Alban, the proto-martyr of England and shining example to the Britons, St Ethelreda, the pious founder of Ely and beloved spouse of Christ, and St John the Baptist, the fiery beacon before the Lord, pray for us all here below. Cool us with the soothing balm of their intercession as the dog days draw on, and sing alongside us, Alleluia, England's song shall never cease. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you like what we're doing, or if you want to help support our mission, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope to see you again soon. Benedicat vos, omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen.